If you have your Bibles, I invite you to turn with me to Philippians chapter 2. And this morning we're looking at verses 14 and 15 of Philippians chapter 2. So let me read those verses, Philippians 2, 14 and 15. Do all things without grumbling or disputing, so that you will prove yourselves to be blameless and innocent, children of God above reproach in the midst of a crooked and perverse generation among whom you appear as lights in the world. Amen. Will you join me in prayer? He awakens me morning by morning. He awakens my ear to listen like one being taught. The Lord God has opened my ear, and I was not disobedient, nor did I turn back. Amen. In an article entitled, Where in the World Are You Headed?, Chuck Wysong and Scott Benson said this, Most people have experienced what Charles Hummel calls the tyranny of the urgent with time and energy consumed by activities having little to do with ultimate goals. Stephen Covey describes it in terms of the clock, which is our commitments, our appointments, our activities, versus the compass, which is our values, our vision, our principles, and our mission. And then they say we experience tension or frustration when the gap between the two becomes intolerable. The gap between your clock and your compass. Well, if somebody asked you, what are your goals in life? How would you answer a question like that? Uh, What would you say? We see in our text... Paul's great desire for the people at Philippi. And I think we could also say this is God's desire for us as the body of Christ, as Christians. Our text tells us of God's desire for us amidst this crooked and perverse world that we live in. And I think one of the first things we need to draw from this passage is that God's desire for us is not to retreat from this world. You know, a lot of people take that kind of approach. They think that they can learn Christianity uh, by isolating themselves, reading books, that kind of thing. But our text tells us quite clearly that we're to live out our faith in the midst of a crooked and a perverse generation in which we live. So we want to ask the question this morning, how do we do that? How do we do that? Well, perhaps the starting place is to recognize that the world in which we live is crooked and perverse, at least by God's standards. And I say that because Speaking of me uh, as much as anyone, it's easy to fall asleep at the wheel, isn't it? Um, It's easy a place uh, like here on the lake to look out and see a beautiful sunset, a beautiful sunrise, a beautiful blue sky. I've been in many of your homes. You have a wonderful view from your home. And to think, oh, what a beautiful world. And to think that, you know, this world's really not that bad. The problem with that, if we're lulled to sleep or so forth, is that we don't determine to be a contrast in this world unless we're in tune with the fact that it is a dark world out there to begin with. Think, we're talking about goals this morning. The title of the sermon is, What Are Your Goals? Well, what are the world's goals? Pleasure, success, money, esteem, things like that. 
But these are not the primary things that we should be pursuing as the body of Christ. These are not the primary goals that we should have as Christians. And while God may grant us times of great enjoyment or success monetarily or pleasure and so forth, these should not be our goals. So what are to be our goals? Well, at least in this passage, and I'm not presenting that this is somehow comprehensive, but Paul mentions three things in particular in our text. And that's what we want to see together this morning. First, he says that the life we as Christians are to live in the midst of this crooked and perverse world is to be one of submission to God. Submission to God. That's what he means in verse 14 when he says, Do all things without grumbling and disputing. Now, secondly, this life is one in which we seek to be blameless before people, before other people. In the middle part of verse 15, he says, So that you will prove yourselves to be blameless and innocent. And then the third goal that Paul mentions in the second part of verse 15 is that our lives are to be blameless in the sight of God also. Notice what he says, children of God above reproach in the midst of a crooked and perverse generation among whom you appear as lights in the world. And so Paul gives us three goals and let's look at each one. First of all, our goal as a Christian is to be submissive to God. Look at verse 14. Do all things without grumbling or disputing. The token of our submission to God is to be evidenced by an attitude of life that does things without grumbling and disputing. The word disputing refers to the inward reasonings of the mind. It's based on a Greek word from which we get our English word dialogue. Now, in our current temperament uh, or our current culture, dialogue is generally thought of in a very positive way, but not so much when it's used in the Bible, at least not when it's used in reference to man and his relationship with God. God does not want us to dialogue or argue with Him. He wants us to listen to Him, right? He wants us to embrace His Word, to embrace His will, and so forth. In our text, the Word points to the reasoning that goes on in our hearts in rebellion against God's will. We are not to be disputing with God. We're not to be dialoguing with Him in our circumstances. When things are not going our way or when we don't like the situation we find ourselves in, we're not to dialogue with God about it. Now, when we do, and when such disputing begins to express itself externally, then it becomes grumbling. And that's the second word that Paul uses in verse 14. Now, in the Old Testament, the word grumbling often described the rebellion of the people of Israel during their years of wandering in the wilderness. They were always grumbling, right? They grumbled when they were in Egypt. And then when they got out of Egypt, they grumbled because they were out of Egypt. Uh, They grumbled because they had nothing to eat. And God fed them manna from heaven. And then they grumbled because there wasn't meat to eat. They were always grumbling. They grumbled for 40 years. When they got into the promised land, they were still grumbling. But can't we be kind of like that as well? Uh, God blesses us, but maybe there's something we don't like about it. You know, some people seem to often be unhappy about something. All of us struggle with this. We can be like the child who uh, is told to go upstairs and put on his pajamas and go to bed. 
And you tell him to do that, and first he kind of just sits there for a moment, right? Well, he's disputing. He's mentally processing uh, what, what you've told him to do. He's disputing in his heart how much he can get away with. He's sort of holding dialogue with himself. And then you get more firm with him. And he leaves the room, what? Grumbling at that point. The dialogue has become external. Well, that's what we may do at times. God may say to us, I want you to do this or that. And at first, we're kind of silent, right? Because... A dialogue's going on inside of us. Or maybe we're saying to ourselves, does God really mean that I have to do this just like that? Or is there maybe another way I can do it? Or we're saying, does God really want me to do this now? You know, can I put it off till tomorrow? Or till next year? Or something like that. We're disputing See, and then God comes along, he says, I mean for you to do it now, and I want you to do it my way. And we kind of like, hmm, hmm. And it becomes grumbling. And what Paul's saying to us in verse 14 is that we shouldn't do that. We shouldn't do that. Rather, we should seek to live as Christians without grumblings and disputings in the midst of an ungodly world. And we should do it because as we sang in the songs, God is trustworthy. God is trustworthy. Uh, His will is always the best for us. And so the goal of our lives then is to live in submission to his will. And such submission will be reflected in a life lived without disputing and grumbling. Now Paul mentions a second goal. And the second thing he says is to be characteristic of our lives is that we are to be blameless and harmless in the sight of others. Look at the first part of verse 15 so that you will prove yourselves to be blameless and innocent. Now the word translated innocent means pure, without mixture. It was used in the vocabulary of primitive metallurgy to talk about pure gold, pure copper, any metal that did not have impurities. It was used also of the preparation of pure clay for making pottery. And in our text, it speaks of a life without mixture before men. And then we're to be blameless. Blameless, just as the inward disputing has an outward expression of grumbling, So the inward characteristic of being innocent has an outward expression of being blameless. In other words, there should be nothing in our lives that gives occasion for scandal. That's the idea. A great example, a great biblical example of that was Daniel. Um, He lived in the midst of a crooked and perverse generation. He didn't live off in isolation or in the corner somewhere. He lived in the king's palace. He worked for the king. And when his enemies tried to do away with him, the only thing they could find fault, you'll remember with him, was in his worship of God. As a matter of fact, in Daniel chapter 6 and verse 5, his enemies said, We shall not find any occasion against this Daniel except we find it against him concerning the law of his God. How powerful is that? You know, would people who examined my life, is that the only thing they'd have to fall back on, is my worship of God. Daniel's enemies knew that the only way they could get him in trouble had to be centered around his worship of God. So they had the king make a law regulating worship, and you know how the story ends. Daniel lived without blame before men. That's what Paul says our goal should be. Okay, so a life of submission to God, 
that's evidenced in a lack of grumbling and disputing, a life where there's no room for scandal before men. And finally, Paul says, we're also to seek, by the grace of God, to live a life that is also blameless before God. Look at verse 15, the second part. Children of God, Paul says, above reproach in the midst of a crooked and perverse generation, among whom you appear as lights in the world. Now, the word Paul uses here for above or above reproach is the same word that he used in Ephesians 1.4 where it's translated without blame. And so in both those places, the word refers to our relationship with God. Paul said in Ephesians 1.4 that God chose us in him before the foundation of the world that we should be holy and without blame before it. Okay? Again, This doesn't mean perfection. None of us is like that or ever will be like that this side of the return of Christ or are going to be with him. I think what it does mean is that we should seek to live lives that are open, that are open before the Lord. We should be able to express with David the prayer he prayed in Psalm 139, verses 23 and 24. Search me, O God, and know my heart. Try me and know my anxious thoughts and see if there be any hurtful way in me and lead me in the everlasting way. Is that a prayer that we can sincerely pray before the Lord? Do we want him to put his finger on the things in our lives that shouldn't be there? Do we want him to put his spotlight, as it were, on us. We're to be blameless before God in that sense. We're to be open. We should live open lives before him. So we see uh, we see the goals that Paul says we're to pursue as Christians. And so the next time somebody asks you, I'm sure this isn't an everyday occurrence, but the next time somebody asks you, what are your goals in life? Maybe you can answer this way. You could say, My goal is to live a life of submission before God, which will be evidenced by my not disputing or grumbling. My goal is to be blameless and innocent in the sight of other people, to be above board in my behavior, to be without scandal. And finally, my goal is to be blameless before God as well, to live without barriers between me and him. Now, how am I going to do this? I can't do this. It's impossible for me to do this in my own strength. But you know what? God is in the business of doing things in us and through us, right, that we can't do ourselves. The Bible tells us how it can happen. We need to remember key passages, I think, daily as we seek to live this way. Passages like Galatians 2.20. I've been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but it's Christ who lives in me. And the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. We need to remember passages like Romans 8, verses 3 and 4. For what the law could not do, and that it was weak through the flesh, God did, sending his own Son in the likeness of sinful flesh and for sin, condemned sin in the flesh, that the righteousness of the law might be fulfilled in us who walk not after the flesh, but after the Spirit. We walk after the Spirit. We seek the filling of God's Spirit in our lives, moment by moment, day by day, we look to Him to live His life in and through us. We need to remember passages like Romans 12, verses 1 and 2. Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. We have to be in the Word. That's how our minds work. 
are renewed, that we may prove what that good and acceptable and perfect will of God is. We need to remember the verses that we looked at just a couple of weeks ago in Philippians chapter 2. Work out your salvation with fear and trembling for, verse 13, it is God who is at work in you both to will and to work for his good pleasure. See, so what do all these verses tell us? Well, they tell us that we're incapable of living out the kind of life that we've talked about. But they also tell us that God is capable of living out that kind of life in you and me as we yield to His Spirit. As we look to Him daily, as we seek the filling of His Spirit in our lives moment by moment, as we present ourselves to Him like Paul talks about in Romans as a living sacrifice. Lord, you use my hands today. Be Lord of my hands. Be Lord of my feet and where they carry me. Be Lord of my mind and the things that I meditate on. Be Lord of my tongue, my conversations. Be Lord of the company that I keep, the things that I put in front of my eyes, the literature that I read, the programs that I watch, and so forth. We present our members to Him as instruments of righteousness. We ask Him to empower us to live for Him day in and day out. As we do that, looking to His strength, then we're able to move in the direction of these goals. Not perfectly, but hopefully with some kind of consistency and with some kind of progression. So now we come to the Lord's table. And this is a great opportunity for us to recalibrate. This is a great opportunity for us to feed on the grace of God that He would send His Son to accomplish what we can so that we can be forgiven. But it's also a time for us to pray like David prayed in that song, to come as an open book. Lord, examine my life. Encourage me, equip me, train me where I need the spotlight to be put on some things, do that as well. It's a time for us to feed upon Christ and to worship Him.